Angela Duncan. I am a best-selling author, speaker, serial entrepreneur, and founder of Empower Her Money podcast. Awesome. Very quick and easy, which is great. And that's going to take us to my favorite part of the show, Angela. This is uh, really where we get a chance to rewind and dive into your story and your journey. And why are you on the Blaze Your Own Trail podcast? So if you can share a little bit about you know, where you grew up, you know, what kind of kid were you, what would you get into back then? And then let's kind of focus on adolescent, middle to high school years. Okay. Well, I'm a survivor of childhood abuse and poverty. And so my stepfather abused me and my mother was an alcoholic. So not much to brag about from the early years, but I mean, it taught me a lot. You know, I grew up not knowing about money. And so it really put me on a pursuit to figure out what this tool is that we call money. And then as I've educated myself and learned from great mentors in my life, you know, now it's my passion and my mission to give back and teach other people about money so that we can help change the world and kind of break that poverty cycle. Cause it really does just come down to a lack of information and education. And when you don't have the right information, then you can't right do the right actions to have financial success and financial freedom. So it's my duty and my, my mission that I want to make sure that I can educate as many people as possible during this life that I get and make sure that, you know, their children don't grow up in the situations that I had to endure being in section eight housing and welfare and free lunches and kids are not nice. So anything I can do to help change that trajectory and change that world for a child in need, then, you know, that's one less person that has to go through what I did. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, well, sorry you had to deal with that. Uh, I actually had a alcoholic abusive stepdad and parents really weren't good with finances and welfare and section eight and free lunches as well. So it sounds like we had a, a similar upbringing, which yeah, it's, it's tough when you're in it, right? You kind of don't understand it. And then once you can see on the other side, which is when we gain new perspective, right? Have different experiences and learn and get educated. Like you said, that's really when things start to shift. And so I'd love to talk about like, when did that shift happen for you? Was it at a early age? I mean, was this like when you were in middle or high school, did your eyes kind of open up? Like when did the curtain kind of peel back, so to speak for you, where you said, Hmm, maybe there is a different way to be able to do things and, and live a life. Yeah, it definitely started in high school when I started to really pay attention and see that other people lived a different life. And, you know, I was like, okay, they have money and we don't. So how do I get money and how do I live a different life? And so I ask a lot of questions. I think that's why I really enjoy being a podcast host is because I do ask questions and I encourage people, especially parents, if you have children, if your kids are curious, let them be curious. Don't stop them from asking questions because it could be something that they're really good at in the future and you wouldn't want to hinder that, right? Support it. So I asked a lot of questions. I had a great accounting teacher in high school who started to teach me about the time value of money and talk about investments. And so it really piqued my interest. And as soon as I was 18 and could sign my own lease, I moved out of the house. It took me five years to finish college because I was working so much just to pay rent and basic necessities, right? And thankfully college was a lot less expensive, but I also made like $5 an hour. So, you know, put that in perspective with people. So right out of the gate, I was a financial advisor, worked on a great team, learned a lot, but real estate, but real estate was definitely something I wanted to learn more about. And the stock market, we have absolutely no control over what happens with stock prices. And I, I don't like that out of control feeling. You probably can understand that Jordan from your childhood too. We, we want to be in control as much as possible of our situation. So I started down this real estate path about 20 years ago, and I, I've been in that space ever since. And I really believe that in order for you to create like real wealth in your life, that real estate investing is the best opportunity that we have here in the US. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that context. And I want to rewind a little bit because I think it would be very helpful for the audience just to hear like, what were some of those jobs? You know, what were those, some of those things that you did to kind of offset some of your college costs at a very low rate? <laughs> As you mentioned, five bucks an hour. I remember having some of those jobs back in the day, but can you tell everyone like, what, what did you did? Like, what places were you investing your time as a sacrifice to make sure that you had this debt paid down? 
Yeah. So back then my mindset was, I just need a job. I need to get paid. And I literally worked seven days a week. So my first job of the day started at 5 a.m. Now take us back. We were in the nineties now. So it was a dispatch center. So if you wanted to call in and page somebody with a message, then you would call into the dispatch center. I would take your message and then I would type it and page it out to whoever it was we're sending it to. So it could be doctors. It could, I mean, there were some very interesting conversations going on back then, but that was from five to nine. And then I would go to school. And then I also had a bank job. I worked for as a teller at a bank. And then I worked at Home Depot at nighttime and weekends because, well, they were open and available. So, you know, I, I kind of just rotated between those jobs and, and made sure that I made really good friends with my bosses so that they could be flexible with my hours. I put in as many hours as I could around my school schedule. But, you know, I would tell them, like, this is my, my school schedule for this semester. Here's the days and times that I can work. You know, I was always on time. I always stayed if needed. There were nights where I would literally like get home at 11 p.m. from Home Depot and wake up at 4 a.m. the next morning to get up and work for that next job and trying to figure out how to study in between that. But I know I needed to put in the work. And I always had this vision that if I studied money and I really became a student and put it into practical use, that I could use this tool and have a better life than where I started. I love it. I love it. So what's interesting is, so in your pursuit to like be better off financially, to learn about finance and to get the education that you need so you don't have to live in prior circumstances, you also were building up a lot of other stuff. And I want to make sure that our listeners catch this. And so you developed hard work, you know, you developed grit, determination, going the extra mile great customer service. I mean, you have to think about this, folks. Think about these different roles. A dispatcher is essentially customer service, but you also have to be quick on your feet. You have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to punch in numbers. I mean, there's a lot going on and probably a lot of craziness. And then you add in the next one is a bank teller. That's all about customer service, making sure that you're smiling at people, right? It's more customer facing. And then you're going into, I'm assuming the late hours at Home Depot was like stocking you doing stuff with pallets right if it's it's more late night but it could have even had more customer service stuff in there as well so you were learning all of these different things kind of in a crash course capacity seven days a week so you were also putting in reps that those things pay off when you're an entrepreneur having to get up early right working long hours does that make sense and so kudos to you for fighting through it and getting past it because I know that's a lot of effort to do and then being able to uh, I'm going to assume you finished school so what happened next what happened after you you were able to do this and, and you know what kind of lessons did you learn by getting a degree while still working seven days a week yeah and that's such a great perspective too you know I didn't really think about it in that regards that that customer service practice really started from age 18, right? When I got that job for those first couple of jobs and to be able to communicate with people and to be able to solve problems and to work on a team. These are all skills that I was learning. And at the time I just thought I was making meant making ends meet. I was just paying the bills and getting through college. And that was my, my whole goal was just to finish college and get that piece of paper. But all of those life lessons and skills that I was acquiring during that time period really went as, as carried forward with me. I'm a very customer service first person, right? I believe in servitude and, and giving back and making sure the client is taken care of. And that definitely came from a very early age. So once I got done with college, I joined Bank of America. I joined a great team that was teaching me a lot about how to invest in bonds and mutual funds. And it and I had some great mentors early on, Jennifer and Anne Therese, and they, they, I just watched them. And you're right, this customer service thing is just so important. They would sit with their clients and just ask questions like, what is it that you need? What, what are your goals? And then dive deeper into that so that we can get into the feelings behind what are your financial goals and what does that feel like when you accomplish them? Who's there with you? Who are you celebrating with? And then let's put together a plan and to get you there, right? Because sometimes people get so lost in the goal part of it that they don't always know that if we can just put a simple plan together, step-by-step, -step, little steps, that we can create massive results for you, but you have to put in the work and the action. 
And if you're not great at sitting down and answering questions or asking questions, then it's really difficult for us to accomplish any goal, whether it's financial or otherwise, without taking the time to really just think about what does that look like to you and how do you feel in that moment? And I do a lot with women entrepreneurs because I do feel like we're more emotional and heart centered. And so when I do that exercise with someone and sit them down and and say, like, if your goal is to pay off your house, you know, in that moment when you pay it off, who's there with you? Who's celebrating? And what does that feel like to you? You know, what does that mean to you? And when you can tie that emotional feeling to your goal, I just feel like we can accomplish things so much quicker than we thought possible because we've tied our brain and our heart together. And when they work together and then we put in the action, it's just incredible to see the results that people can accomplish when they really put all of that pieces together in their puzzle. Yeah, it's great. And visualization is very powerful. And I love the fact that you're really walking them through the process and you're essentially having them like kind of paint a picture. You're like, what is this going to look like? What, what are all the ingredients? Right. And that's so important. And that essentially is all has to do with storytelling. So you are telling a story and teaching them how to tell a story of what the future is going to look like. And when you can take people through that, storytelling is just one of those things that I think is always going to convert. You know, if you can tell really good stories, mm -hmm. people are going to buy in and want to know more. They're going to want to listen more and they're going to be more empowered, right, to making a decision in confidence. So I love the fact that that's not only how you did it then, but that's also, it sounds like what you're doing today, which we're going to be diving into here a little bit more. So, so I'd love to find out what happened after that first role, first role out of college, Bank of America, learning some great stuff. How long did you stay there? And then what was the next kind of step on your journey? Yeah. So I stayed there for several years, about, I think I was there almost 10 actually. And I was reaching a point where I was bringing home my laptop on the weekends. I was working crazy hours and I met a boy. So he was in real estate and he, we ended up, you know, getting married and we were together for quite a long time, but he got so busy in real estate and he's like, I need to hire an assistant. And we sat down and we talked about it. And for our family, I was like, I'm working crazy hours. You're working crazy hours. Why don't I just become your assistant? And in my mind, I thought, oh, you know, Monday through Friday, I'll clock in, clock out, even though this is his business, but it was much different than that. And it, and it ended up being that, you know, when you go into a partnership with someone, especially someone you're married to, you really have to learn what your best qualities are. And I think we failed to do that initially. You know, we always used to joke saying that he fired me or I quit or whatever, you know, we would laugh about it. But when you're in a partnership with someone and running a company, it's very important for you to understand what your own skill set is and what that partner skill set is so that you can delegate those roles appropriately, right? I wasn't great at marketing, but I'm extremely detailed. I'm great with customers and I'm very good with numbers. So understanding that those were my strengths and whatever tasks were associated with those strengths became my part of the company. And the things that he was great at became his parts of the company. But it's very difficult, especially in the beginning part of a, a marriage and a partnership with a business to kind of let go some of those tasks because I am definitely the person that needs to be in control. And you've got to recognize that about yourself. And when you can recognize what your, I don't want to say faults are, but you know, your, your, the things that you're not strong in, and releasing that to somebody else who's going to do much better was better decision for the company, even though it was very difficult for me in the beginning and, and still to a lot of things today to release that control, right? To somebody else and to, to know that they're going to take care of it. Like you would take care of it, hopefully even better. And they're going to be much better at it so that you can have your time back to use your skills to make an impact on other people. Yeah, that's, that's a hard one to swallow. I know that there's going to be a lot of listeners that identify with that. They're like, man, there's like things that I just cannot let go of, you know, and, it, and whether it's, mm -hmm. you've just done it forever and you like it your certain way and you don't want anyone else to touch it because they're probably going to screw it up. That's like kind of one thing that we tell ourselves, or it's like, no, I'll be able to do it way faster or I'll be able to do X insert excuse here, you know, and it is tough and I've had that struggle and, and I've now at a point where I do have a great team and I have people to give things to. And man, the, 
the time freedom and then just kind of the feeling of knowing things are happening when I don't have to be there. It, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> so if, if somebody hears this and they're like, man, I, I've been so afraid to try this out, I would say just try it. You know, it, it is going to feel weird at first, but there are some positive things that can be gained and massive opportunity for you to be able to invest in things that maybe you've been putting off. You know, for me, it was, I wanted to be able to go speak on more stages and go to meet more clients and travel. Mm -hmm. And so now that time freedom has enabled me to do that and, and do different conferences in Europe and, and go meet clients around the U S and it's been so great to be able to have that. And I'd love to hear like, what did that do for you? Like, was that a big thing for you when you decided to do it? Are you, do you still struggle with it personally? I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah. So it wasn't about until three years ago, uh, when I went through my divorce that I feel like I finally found my voice, you know, part of that delegation of skills during that marriage was that. I told myself he was the better speaker. So he needed to be the one on stages or on the interviews and I would be behind the scenes. And I was really silencing my own voice by doing that. And I didn't realize that at, a, at the time, and you know, it's kind of hindsight now, but knowing that I had to find my voice after we got divorced and I had to run my company by myself, I needed to be the CEO. I needed to be the one on stage, the one with the vision, the one communicating, the one on podcasts. That was a very difficult transition for me because I always told myself that I was the one behind the scenes and that I didn't need to be the one that spoke up. But now that I feel like I found my voice and I know that I'm an intelligent person. I know I've got 20 plus years of real estate experience. I know I've got a lot of value to teach other people. I understand now that I was hurting my clients by not having a voice, by not sharing the knowledge that I had, because we all have different experiences. We all have different things that we can teach. And each one of us have that responsibility to take those experiences and share it with those people around us that want to learn, that want to do better in their life. And so now finding my voice, having a podcast, speaking on stages, writing a book has really given me like a clear vision of how I can truly impact everybody that's around me that is ready to listen, that wants to change their financial future. These terms and spreadsheets and apps are very simple for me to understand, but I realize it's not for everybody. And money is one of those topics that people are just very scared to talk about, especially women. And I want to be able to help them find their voice too, so that they can feel like they can ask the right questions so that they can create their own goals and accomplish their own goals and celebrate each other together. But it needed me to go through that transition to find my voice first before I can help other women find their voice. And that transformation for me and watching it now with other people has just been like another incredible step in my life. And Jordan, that goes back to gratitude too, right? Like when I hear you talk about stories and the things that you've accomplished and how you change lives too, just being grateful that I'm on this journey and that I get the opportunity to help other people, right? Not, not everyone gets to say that, right? So being very grateful and just sharing that gratitude and that positivity, because we get enough negativity from the rest of the world, especially around money that how do I take a, a tough subject and make light of it and bring positivity to it and get people excited about it. Right. Yeah. I think I went totally off on a tangent there, but no worries. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. No, that that's good. Yeah. No, I love what your you know mission is, what it stands for and, and how you're truly wanting to help educate people. Like you said, in a topic that's typically boring, like no one, it's like the thing everyone wants to have, but no one wants to learn how to get it. So the fact that you're helping mm -hmm. people do it in a, in a way that's adding as much value as possible is, is definitely awesome. And I'd love to touch on your real estate journey a little bit because you've you know been in the, 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 in the finance world, you doing things like that. And then you've had for the last 20 years, this real estate journey and this real estate career. So can you tell the audience a little bit about what that's looked like? Like when, when you came in, like, where did you start? Did you just get your license and then you were trying to sell homes and then did that turn into wanting to flip or invest? Like, I'd love to hear it because 20 years is definitely something that we need to talk about. It's a lot of time. We're talking about two decades of time and so many stories I'm pretty confident of and, and I'm sure some wins and some losses along the way. So I'd love just to hear how did it all start? And then tell us a little bit about the journey, some experiences and lessons you've learned. 
Yeah. So my journey I was talking about started because I did get in business with my ex-husband and we ultimately ended up buying a Remax franchise and owning our own brokerage. And keep in mind that 20 years ago was right before the housing market burst, right? And I got into real estate thinking that this is going to be so easy. I'm going to help investors. I know money. I can teach people, you know, how to look at numbers and buy investment properties. Well, it ended up being a great time for them to do that, but it was an extremely difficult market. And so shifting was very important, you know, paying attention to trends. What can we do to help people in this type of market? I think no matter what real estate market we're in, there's always opportunities. And so at that time, you know, we were in Tampa, Florida, we could buy a single family house for like $50,000, fix it up and then rent it for, you know, $1,000. So the numbers made so much sense. So that's really where I focused and also started to build our single family rental portfolio at the same time as I was helping clients. I'm going to practice what I preach, right? I don't want to teach you something that I haven't yet done myself and been successful. I don't believe in that at all. So helping other people while also, you know, in investing ourselves. So that's where, where it started. And I managed those properties at one point. I think the most we had was maybe 15 properties, but I got tired of having to take phone calls on Christmas because the toilet was broken. You know, everyone had family over and now the toilet's not working. So we started to unwind and get out of the single family properties. And that's when I started to learn about syndications and investing in multifamily and how much less management is involved when you, you know, have an, a, a management company that manages your apartment complex instead of you. Now, the, granted, the returns weren't as great and you don't have as much appreciation potentially or, you know, getting other people's money to, to bring all together to buy that apartment. It's a little bit more managing there. But I just fell in love with that, like multifamily, having an apartment complex, someone else managing it, the monthly income that comes in. Sounds like it's all sunshine, right? But no, we're in a current environment where interest rates, you know, spiked. I'm in Florida and, and insurance has tripled over the last 18 months. And so a lot of people are in trouble right now. And we have to like really evaluate and make sure that this is still the right opportunity for us and for our clients. But it's just paying attention. You've got to study your market, whatever business you're in, you need to be a continual student. I'm going to be a student forever. So as we're shifting in real estate markets, what are the other opportunities? Where else can we be investing? How can we help other clients and really paying attention to what people who are more successful are doing and asking a lot of questions, going to a lot of events and making sure that we get the right information so that we can make the right decisions or the best right decision, right? No, we can't predict the future, but real estate for me is just the, the best way for you to really accumulate wealth, to take advantage of the IRS tax codes that have been written and they're there for a long time for us to use. There aren't IRS tax codes for the stock market unless you're doing retirement planning. So, you know, the IRS is encouraging us really to buy real estate. So we need to make sure that we're doing it in a smart manner and then we teach, we give back. And that's how, you know, you can help other people around you build wealth as well. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I've loved that you've had such a well-rounded, you know, journey, you know, having properties, managing those properties, you know, doing the investing side of things, getting into multifamily and having success kind of in all those areas has, and I'm sure uh, losses in all those areas too, those have all really helped shape who you are and have really helped increase your knowledge in the real estate space. And it's interesting you got into multifamily because I spent 15 years working for a management company called Gables Residential. It was a big management company and I did on-site management. So I know about those late night calls, you know, <laughs> with the toilet and the maintenance stuff and, and dealing, dealing with people where they live is not easy, right? When you're a property manager and you're and basically everything's your fault. So I definitely feel your pain that <laughs> you're dealing with that. But I also know that I always saw smiles on the five or six people's faces that pulled up in the nice vehicles and the suits that were coming to kind of do due diligence of buildings because that was like some of the most on feet work that they did right because a lot of the other stuff was analytics and seeing if the thing works and then collecting the check so i also kind of i know all ends of of that process and it's so interesting that you were on the other side of it i was on one side you were on the other side and and now i'm part owner of a company in belgium that we're on the vendor side, we've developed prop tech solutions. So I'm kind of getting a, a full circle, you know, multifamily uh, experience, which is pretty cool. So 
one of the things I was going to ask you is what kind of tips can you give somebody that may consider investing in real estate, you know, within the next year, you know, they're like, Hey, you know what? I've got some money in my 401k. Or I've got some money in a Roth IRA, or I've got some savings and I've wanted to pull the trigger, but for some reason they're just hesitant. So what would be kind of the first three tips somebody should take? Yeah. So first thing is pick a lane, right? So mine is real estate, but there's 20 lanes that you could pick within real estate, if not more. So not only, you know, picking real estate is your lane, but diving into where do you want to do, right? Do you have time to manage a property yourself? If not, then you're going to want to perhaps find either like a real estate fund or someone else that's already doing syndications with good experience, then just become their, you know, have them mentor you talk about what is it that's important to them? Cause it's not just the asset itself. I want to know if we get into hard times, what their you know thoughts are, how do they act in business? Because that needs to be aligned too, not just the investment piece itself, but the person who's managing it, right? Another lane that I really have been studying these last couple of year, years here in Florida is tax liens. Tax liens are very interesting. And when you're dealing with the government, you know they tell you what they're gonna pay you up front. So it's a very conservative investment. It's a way to be in the real estate market without being super involved. It's more of a passive lane. So understand like how much time do you have that you wanna put into this investment vehicle, right? So not only are you picking a lane, deciding how much time that you can put into it, but finding the right mentor and partner that can teach you and not just one person because we all have you know, myself, I'm sure you're, you're included is we, we have lots of mentors, right? Lots of people who we ask questions to that are experts in their field. And, and when you're brand new to an industry, you don't want to just jump in. That's how you're going to lose money. No matter what you invest in, if you don't know what you're investing in, you, you get lucky maybe half a percent out of a hundred times, right? So finding many mentors in that industry. And there's so much information out there that can be confusing. YouTube is a great place to, to at least get started and get high level education and then find someone that speaks to you that, you know, aligns with your value system and say, Hey, I'm interested in learning more about this investment opportunity and what can you teach me? And when they give their time, understand that you're going to want to give something back to doesn't necessarily mean your money. It could be referrals. It could be whatever you're an expert in that you can teach them for free, but I'm a give give. So if I'm asking you for your time, then I want to make sure that I can add value back to you in whatever manner that I'm an expert in, because then that value to them is going to go a lot further. And obviously Lord, they're, they're more willing to help you. So those would probably be my top three things when you're just getting started in whatever investment vehicle that you choose. Awesome. I love it. Great tip. So essentially what I heard is figure out an asset class in the real estate space that you want to invest in, right? Find a mentor, invest time learning from them, but, but also make sure that you are adding value right back to them, whether that's through skills or gifts that you have or resources that you have or your network, but make sure that you're always adding value. So three really great tips. I know that those are going to be helpful for our listeners. And I, I want to give you a, a moment just to talk a little bit about your book, Empower Your Money, and you know where can people find it? What are some takeaways that people can expect to gain? Uh, and then talk a little bit about what exactly you're doing today to help women on their financial journey. Yeah. So I wrote the book last year, Empower Your Money. And I learned a lot about keywords and wanted to make sure that the audience understood that this was a book for them. So empower your money, not empower her money. And I wanted to make it practical. I'm a very practical person. When I put on events, it's not a, like a networking event. If you come to my event, I'm there to teach you. So the book is to teach you, but I wanted to keep it simple. This is a book for someone who just needs some advice on, you know, what to do with their money or they just don't know what they don't know. So I'm giving you 101 tips on what you can implement today in your life to help you with your financial goals. And it's not a complicated book. You don't need a dictionary to read it. Um, these are just action items, action items that you're going to implement into your life. I want to help you get to that next level. And if you take one tip from that book and implement it into your life, I mean, I think you can have a huge impact on your own journey. And so that was important to me because it's a tangible item. It, it's going to stay hopefully, you know, forever. Books can stay around forever. Look at the Bible. 
And it was just a way for me to continue to give back and impact people through a different way of learning. Because maybe they don't want to watch YouTube videos. Maybe they're not in a place where they have a lot of events they can go to. Well, here's a book. You can go to Amazon. You can buy it. It ships right to your house. You can even download the Audible copy, which is a lot less expensive. It's $1.99, which is the cheapest that Amazon would let me put. So how do we reach more people and create more impact is just picking different avenues that they are going to consume this information. So that's a big way of what I do to help people. I also love speaking at events and I do it very practical. Same thing is I want to give you tips. I'm going to give you advice on what you can walk away with today and go back, implement to help you on your own financial goals. Not every tip is going to apply to every person. So I like to do multiple ideas and depending on the audience that I'm speaking to, but I don't want to be your cheerleader necessarily. I mean, if you hire me as a coach, that's part of what I do, but I'm going to hold you accountable. We're going to make goals. We're going to have action items. We're going to track our progress. And then when we have our little wins, we're going to celebrate. And if you get knocked down, it's okay. Pick yourself back up and just keep moving forward. And don't let your mistakes keep you from moving forward. That was something probably I learned very early on when my first investment, I lost 20% and decided that I was never going to invest again, but I'm glad I did because I wouldn't be here today and teaching what I am teaching if I didn't keep moving forward through that, that first big mistake. Yeah, that's great. Appreciate you giving that context. And you know, the one thing I always tell people is the, the thing that I can guarantee is going to happen in your life is you're going to face adversity, you know, and basically at that point you get to decide what you're going to do next. You know, are you going to get back up and keep moving forward? Like you said, Angela, or, or are you going to stay down? And what's nice about having coaches. And I know you alluded it to earlier. Yes, I have multiple coaches in, in different areas. And why do we do that? Well, I need to continue to get fed. I need to have people to hold me accountable. And so if you've heard this episode and you've gotten value out of the things that uh, Angela has been talking about, definitely make sure you all reach out to her. Uh, I'm going to link all your info, Angela, down in the show notes. We'll make it super easy for people, but I'd love just to give you the stage here at the end. If there's a resource or a bit of information you want to share with the audience, by all means, feel free. Yeah. So if you go to my website, empowerhermoney.com, I do have a mini version of my book available for free. You can just download it. It gets sent over to you actually via email. So you, yes, you have to put in your email to get it, but that's a free resource. And it, it kind of just gives you seven tips instead of the 101. So you've got some ideas to start with for free. And the website again is empowerhermoney.com. That's also the name of my podcast, my Instagram, my TikTok. I love doing videos. So if you ever have a money question, no matter what you think, if it's big or small, send me a message and I do a personal video myself and I send it back to you. Awesome. Appreciate you sharing all of that. Again, we're going to make sure all of that is in the show notes, folks, so make sure to jump over there when you're done listening and check all of that out. Angela, you are a true trailblazer, my friend. Uh, kudos to you for putting in the reps every day, for being a practitioner. And I love the fact that you said that, like, hey, I'm not going to help somebody with something that I haven't done myself before because that is so important. I'm consistently telling my coaching clients, like, you have to be a practitioner. If you don't know it, go learn it. And then once you learn it and you get good at it, then you could teach it, right? But don't go start talking about it if you don't know about it. So I uh, just want to say uh, kudos to you for all your hard work, for everything that you've built, and keep blazing your own trail. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Empower Her Money podcast. I am grateful for you. Please make sure to leave us a five-star review, like this podcast, share it, subscribe, and let's keep teaching others how to take control and be empowered with their finances.